Um, and I'm really delighted to introduce Emma Schneider for two reasons. One is, some of you may know, but others may not, there's a new track in the environmental studies major here at Tufts, and it's a, an environmental humanities track. Um, and it's brand new this year, and our speaker today is a wonderful environmental humanist. So it'll give you a taste of what uh, one person uh, working in environmental humanities is doing. And Emma is um, a graduate of Oberlin College, where she majored in French and English, graduated with high honors in English, um, showing that uh, English can be a useful uh, major. And she's now a PhD student completing her work in the English department here at Tufts, and she's working in American literature and environmental humanities. Emma, I could say a lot of things about Emma. I'm going to just point out two things. Um, Emma is the holder of two really prestigious uh, fellowships simultaneously. This year, she is a CHAT fellow at Tufts, and CHAT stands for Center for the Humanities at Tufts. And there are only two CHAT fellowships awarded each year um, to um, two PhD students. Emma is one of them and holds that fellowship this year. Simultaneously, she is a Switzer fellow, and that is a national competition on the two coasts of the United States. And it's a fellowship um, awarded to people for their leadership in environmental studies. So quite a distinction to have either of these fellowships. To have them both at the same time is really a feather in, in uh, Emma's cap. I would only mention, in addition to that, that Emma's a super good teacher uh, here at Tufts, and she's a person um, that also takes that commitment to teaching and to activism outside the walls of Tufts. She's volunteered working on environmental issues and with uh, children in the uh, Somerville schools, and she's currently volunteering at Medford High uh, in environmental humanities work. So with that, let's hear from Emma, not me, and it's delightful to have her here. I think I don't mean that, right? Thank you, Liz, for that lovely introduction. And thank you also for Ty, who has also supported me this year. Um, I've just had such a bundle of help from so many people. So today, I am going to share a little bit about the sort of studies that I have been doing over the past several years as part of my dissertation, and then using those to lead into thinking about how they might influence environmental education as we're practicing it, involving the humanities in environmental studies in ways that has often been sort of left to the sidelines um, or thought of as something that isn't part of that science social studies pairing. So I begin this with this image of the song sparrow, which is from a, an early 19th or an early 20th century book uh, about American songbirds. And I begin with it because when I was first trying to figure out this project, I reread Silent Spring and I was very struck by how listening was so part of her problem that she was bringing up, that we had all of this sound of the natural world and suddenly that sound was gone. How did we listen enough to notice the absence? And so I was interested in that idea that listening isn't just um, about hearing what's already present, but it's about having enough knowledge of the natural world, enough knowledge of our communities that we can hear what's not present as well. And so that was sort of the initial challenge to the, the projects that I was beginning. And so I began to just sort of dig in saying, okay, well, what does listening have to do with environmentalism? What does listening have to do with environmental justice? So there's this great... Um, researcher out of Yale Law School called Dan Cahan. Has people heard of him before? A few? Uh, so I would recommend reading this article if you haven't already. It's a fascinating way of thinking about how we share information as communities and as scientists and as environmentalists. And he studies and he thinks, so our usual idea or model is that if we have lots of information and we tell people our information, they're going to they're gonna agree with us because we have such great information. And instead, he found that that's not true, that the more information we gave people, the more it polarized them, because they would take that information and they would use it to sort of strengthen the position that they already had. When I read that, I was like, ah, that's scary. But also, what can stories do for that? Because stories help us create new frameworks to put that information into, and it helps us connect our communities and our value systems to that information so that it matters to us. 
So I was particularly interested in taking the sort of ideas from this and saying, okay, if deficit isn't a problem, it's not that people don't have enough information. It's not that we're not speaking out enough. It's that people aren't listening. There's some gap in the ways that we're hearing each other. And I feel like the more we listen to the news these days, the more that is blatantly apparent in my life. That it's not a lack of information so much as it is a lack of information and a lack of engagement. So in this presentation today, I'm going to go through a couple different things that are thinking about how listening and environmentalism, particularly environmental justice, are related. So first, for me, this is about rethinking the listenable. When I say the listenable, it's kind of a funny word that I've made up to serve my purposes, but thinking about what are the things that we've defined as meaningful sound, like the voices of powerful people, and what are the, sw the sounds that we have defined as meaningless noise or rumbling um, or hearing voices. And there are huge amounts of power dynamics that you could easily think of. So if, if we had one system that says, the person in power, me speaking in front of you in the whole room, my sound is meaningful. But there are countless other noises happening in this room, other sounds that we've defined as noise. So I'm interested in humanities as an imaginative space that helps us think about how could we reconsider which things we define as sound. Where might there be meaning that's speaking out, that's telling us about environmental injustices that we're not paying attention to because we've coded it as noise as opposed to as meaningful sound. And the second piece that I'm looking at, that's all really nice and well and good. We can listen to these things that are telling us meaningful sound, but we don't. So what are the challenges to listening? What are the things that inhibit us from listening to things that would promote environmental justice? And then in the last piece, I'll be talking about the environmental education piece that I'm very interested in. I'm talking about how we learn to listen and sort of what um, practices we could move forward with and what questions we're asking in order to bring that into action. I want to pause for a minute to uh, admire, I guess, this beautiful painting, it, or uh, wood, wood carving, prop, excuse me. The reason I put it there is that I think that this image is a lovely way of thinking about our biotic community as all being present and as having history and ancestry present within the life that is current in it. And I think that is a really big piece of what I'm talking about, is not just listening to the present moment, but sort of listening to the depths of communities and the depths of histories in the stories that exist. Um, and so I think this, this image really represents that beautifully. So in line with talking about how I formed this project, I want to begin with a particular author that I spend a lot of time with. His name is Simon Ortiz and he's an Acoma Pueblo author who lives in New Mexico. And he is a foremost um, poet in environmental justice writing, thinking about how to bring his own um, community and his own experiences working in a, a, a landscape really defined by militarism and uranium mining, how, and sacred spaces, and how those three interact with each other. So he's really, he's really confronting what is environmentalism in this very violent space that has lots of history, but also lots of change and lots of forced movement. And he very frequently pauses to ask us to listen. He doesn't ask to speak out so much as he says, there's all of this information that is present in the land, that's present in the stories that exist in our communities that teach us how to live. How could we listen better to those stories? So to give you a little glimpse of his style, I'm going to give a short summary of one of his stories. I think it'll help you see what I'm saying. So this is a little bit of a stretch because this is a female goat, but the main story in our story is a male goat. His name is George. Um, but George is a very um, feisty goat, we could say. And George comes onto a farm and he knocks over the little girl that lives on this, this farm. And the dad gets very angry and he says, George needs to learn, or that goat needs to learn a lesson. I think it's important that George has a name. The little girl doesn't have a name, the dad doesn't have a name, and the dad doesn't use the name George. Just the reader knows that it's George, and the little girl knows that it's George. Anyways, so he says that we need to teach that goat a lesson, 
He's doing terrible things, and so he hooks him up to a post and says he doesn't get any water until he learns his lesson. And the little girl is sort of like, hmm, I guess that's a good thing. I'm like upset that I got knocked over. Um, and so she says, okay, and she listens to her dad, and she goes inside, and it's hot out, and the sun is beating down, and George at first is really tough. He says, you know, you get the sense in the story that George can take it. And then as the sun keeps beating down, he keep, keeps not being able to get to the water, the little girl goes up to her dad and she says, George isn't looking so good. I think it's probably fine. And his, his dad's like, nope, he hasn't learned his lesson yet. He's staying there. And so the little girl, again, she kind of looks at George and she looks at her dad and she says, well, I guess I should listen to my dad. He probably knows best. Later that night, in the middle of the night, and I think we can take the night as a time when change is happening, where the world isn't working quite in the same power dynamics as it was before. But so in the middle of the night, the little girl wakes up and she's like, ah, this is wrong. I have to go see George. And she runs out and she finds George. And George looks at her. But it's too late. She realized in that moment that she needed to have listened to the signal she was seeing from George. But as she runs out there, he dies from thirst. And that little girl goes up the next morning and she looks her dad defiantly in the eyes. And you know that she's not going to listen to him anymore. So that is the story that I begin this project with. So it's not only about learning to listen to those whose voices have been made meaningless or made not important in various ways. It's also about learning not to listen to certain voices that have had great power and have dominated so that there's not discourse, there's simply outpourings of uh, dictations, I suppose. So in this first part of my project, and I put these titles up not so much because I'm going to talk all about them, but if it's something that intrigues you, these are recommendations of books to go to. But I begin with books that are thinking about other than human animals and wondering about what would it look like if we thought of them as our kin and we listened to them as such. Not expecting them to speak human, I mean, of course they're not going to speak human, they're going to speak goat, but that we could still hear meaningful sound in that. And so what would an imaginative space let us do to think about what questions we might ask and what ways we might reorder or re-envision the world if we imagined it were possible to listen to a goat? And the next part, it sort of takes a step past that. And I moved to this um, ethnobotanist called Robin Wall Kimberer in her memoir, Braiding Sweetgrass. She mostly studies mosses. She's a biologist. Um, but she has some beautiful writing about how she's learning from her Potawatomi heritage and her mosses and trees and kind of combining that botany knowledge and, um, and traditional knowledge and new ways of learning. So she says, so much has been forgotten, but it is not lost as long as the land endures and we cultivate people who have the humility and ability to listen and learn. And the people are not alone. All along the path, non-human people help. So I pause there because I think that Kimmerer has a very beautiful way of asking us to rethink our preposition. She asks us not what can we learn about plants, but what can we learn from them. And that difference to me is one very representative of thinking not so much in a speech construct of what can plants say, but what can we hear? What can we listen from them? And so thinking about where our, our learning priorities are is a big piece of what she's talking about in this shifting from plants as pure materials that are objects of study, a very visual sort of way of thinking, to plants as members of a community that have their own ways of communicating, but that if we pay attention to in various ways, we could imagine learning from, not just about. And these pictures in the back are from the Andrews Experimental Forest, which she writes about quite a bit. Um, but it's also a fascinating place because it is a forest that brings together um, writers and um, of poets and novelists and essayists, but also many scientists, and asks them to pay attention to this forest together and to think about how they're different habits of paying attention can help them learn from each other as well as from the forest. There are questions that a humanist might pause over for, for days, just pondering, oh, but what does that preposition mean? And, and the scientist 
might not have ever bothered to think about that preposition, but is really fascinated with this, this moss that's growing in this really curious way. And so if you have them sitting at lunch together, this forest seems to say, this forest organization is asking, what do we, what do we notice when we put those people together instead of making this great distance between them? And so there are a few books that I've looked at. There are many, many books that you could take to, to look at this idea. But what is important to me in these books is that they're taking plants and they're not just making them as scenery or background in the, the stories that they're telling, but they're figuring them as members of a community that matter for the health of that community. And that's important not just in a plant ecologist, I'm glad that there are plants in the world sort of way, but in the degree to which it is important to traditional knowledge and to communities' health and well-being. And so that's, I think, where environmental justice comes back into this story in a way that, that it might seem that it is slipping back out. But as we have communities, so the Birch Bark House, has anyone read it? Some people read it in elementary school now. It's geared towards like third graders. It's in the same realm as um, the Little House on the Prairie books in which it goes through the daily life of an Ojibwe girl doing her sort of daily life thing. Um, but it's written by Louise Erdrich, who is a Minnesotan author who's turtle, um, turtle band Chippewa. And she is thinking about how do we not learn to distance ourselves from the land as we grow up and become independent, solitary human beings, but rather how is maturing a matter of learning to listen to the community and learning to know all of the connections between it. But that kind of learning depends on a very grounded and a very local sense of knowledge, that you know the plants that inhabit this space, and you know the stories that go with those plants, because they all have their own properties and their own history. And so the forced removal of people from those spaces, or the movement of people out of their traditional spaces, disrupts all of that weddedness to place, all of those stories. And so it becomes this deeply imbricated environmental justice forced removal problem and ecological problem in which we've lost all of this precise knowledge of place because we've been doing um, acts of social injustice. And so I think that's a very important piece to hold on to in this story, is how much the, the violence of social acts has ecological impacts that we're apt to ignore because they, we think of them as very distant in their ways of knowing. So this is Omakaius. She's our main character. Um, and, and she's surrounded by plants, which I loved as an image, because one of the main things she's doing as she grows up is learning, learning to listen to the plants as medicine. And her grandmother says, I think they, the plants, talk to each other all the time, but our minds are not always peaceful enough to hear them. just want to pause for that for a moment to think about what are the things that we don't listen to, not because they aren't speaking, not because they're not making sound, but because we didn't bother to be quiet enough to hear them? And what sort of lessons we learn, we have speech classes, we learn to speak out against injustice, but we very rarely have time where we're asked to listen in the sort of fast-paced Western US culture that many of us are, are latched into. Um, and so she's really asking us to think about what would it mean to, to put a higher value that this is an elder, the grandmother, saying we need to take the time to listen. What would it mean if our, our sort of leaders, one of the first things that they did was listen? I actually have to point you out because you did a listening tour when you first came here, and I was so impressed that that, that was a sort of model of leadership that started with listening and that that's something that we could be doing much more broadly. This, this sort of shifting of power dynamics and valuing, I think, is beautifully illustrated by this map from the book Mama Day by Gloria Naylor. And I would draw your attention to this little church, which is approximately the same size, if not a little smaller, than this morning glory, maybe a uh, potato blossom. But um, to think about how creative, imaginative work can say, oh, our values are, we're used to them being constructed in this way, but they're a construction. We, we can pull them apart and we can put them together in a different orientation. And so saying, what would it look like if the world where the plants were just as important 
and the sort of histories that they hold, the, the live oak there with its association with ancestors and the people who came before, um, what would it mean if that was just as important as these sort of standards of Western civilization in the, the Christianity or church building? And so in that space, it's not just about listening to individual plants as members of a community that matter, but it's about sort of thinking, what are our habits of sort of delineations of power, whose voices are loudest and whose are quiet? In a humanities sort of creative space, very easy to flip those for just a moment and experiment with what it would be like if there were some other way. So I think that's where I see the humanities really having a lot of power in thinking about listening and, and challenging us as environmental studies um, thinkers of what are our habits of doing things and how can creative spaces help us shake that up. So I said that in the first half I would be talking about what things are listenable and how we might change that, those boundaries or challenge those boundaries. In the second half, I'm talking a little bit more about those challenges to listening. And I begin with this really grim image um, that is made by an Appalachian artist. It's a sculpture, actually, although it's hard to tell from this, um, who's thinking about the effects of mountaintop removal mining on his community, as you may have guessed. Um, and that, that image for me is one that is so full of that sense of disruption and, and violence and the loss of ability to hear the voices that were present in various ways. And so we can imagine if we could listen to the trees that were present in this sort of place and hear the communication that's happening with the plants, we would hear some really stressed out plants and then we would hear very little at all. And so in this section, it's thinking much more about what are the ways that industry disrupts our ability to be grounded in a place and to hear that place. So I look at a bunch of different Appalachian texts that are thinking about this in different ways, but all of them are really interested in the ways that place-based education is lost and is, is purposefully lost in various ways by industrial um, labors, particularly mining, that rely on the interchangeability of people and place. So you might think about, um, you could tie this back to slavery systems where people are enslaved and they become parts in that system that are interchangeable and thought of as commodified objects as opposed to as people. And we might also think about this as the mountains of Appalachia that are thought of as interchangeable mountain parts that you can destroy one and then move to the next because they don't have meaning in and of themselves or as individuals. So each of these texts are, you can see in this one there's a young, young character and there are also young children in this one. There are books that are looking at how do children learn what to listen to? What are the challenges for those children in paying attention to the world they inhabit? And some of that challenge is a lack of someone teaching them a groundedness of place, of teaching them the stories of those particular ginseng plants or those particular haulers. But some of it is that it's really scary to listen. And I feel like I encounter that ever more frequently, that it's sometimes nicer to plug your ears and run away. And so these folks are also really thinking about what is the sort of courage and strength and, and community needed to keep listening to something that is so hard to pay attention to. And so in these texts, it's not only thinking about how do we listen to the earth or how do we listen to those who are suffering a lot of harm, but also how do we listen to each other as communities so that we have strength to keep going. And I think that that is another piece of, of this sort of listening um, framework that I'm thinking about that's not about how do I tell you, my neighbor, what I think you should do, but how can I listen to you so that we feel connected and feel part of this community that can support itself against a pretty violent onslaught, as we saw in the previous image. So I'm going to pause for a minute so you can read and, and check out this image, because it's kind of wild. So we're going to come back for this after I read the David Orr quote. Toward the natural world, American education emphasizes theories, not values, 
abstraction rather than consciousness, neat answers instead of questions, and technical efficiency over conscience. And that, to me, is perfectly illustrated in a very strange way by this image, which I pulled off of a Kentucky uh, mining education website. As some of you may know, many large industries provide a lot of educational materials. Um, so like Cargill makes a bunch of materials, most of the mining, uh, there's a West Virginian Mining Association and a Kentucky Mining Association that put out tons of materials for teachers to use. I don't personally know how much these particular ones are, are used, but I know someone who grew up in the area of Cargill said that her school was completely inundated with the materials from the industry. So I do think they are used to some degree. Um, and I, when I found this, I was very struck both by the idea that the entire land reclamation lesson for primary students was this word find, that this would teach you what land reclamation was. Um, and so their goal was to put that sentence at the top to color in and you would find an animal in the picture. But the level of dissociation from place, not only of not learning land reclamation other than as a word that exists, but that that leads you to a kangaroo if you leave in, live in Kentucky is wildly not place-based. It is just like, it blew my mind. Um, but, so I think this to me hones in on the, the, whether it's conscious or not, the effects of this industry to distance students from having a real connection to their place and to the place that they live as meaningful and as mattering for its specificity seems really stunningly uh, illustrated by this image. And so I was thinking a lot about how um, the sort of masculinity of mining culture and the, the mechanization of it really encourages, and both of the characters in these books, the, the boys in particular, are really pushed towards thinking of themselves as machines, thinking of themselves as these tough sort of interchangeable parts people that can, can overcome the landscape, who are stronger than the landscape, because by associating themselves with machines, they can associate themselves with industry, and there they have some sense of power. Um, but in doing so, they even further lose any connection with that sense of place and of reason to protect it or to fight for it. So this takes me as a little side diversion of some of the work that I've been doing outside of um, my, my computer and desk and book. And that has been to take students outside and to do other sorts of projects that try to create a sense of place. And we were talking, if people were present for the talk last week, there was a lot of discussion of wonder and a lot of sort of thinking about how you could just pay attention more. Because when I was reading all of these different texts, one of the main threads that comes through them, I've, I've named it listening. But you could also just call it paying attention. And that, I think, is something that is such a struggle for many, many people. And so these projects in place-based education and outdoor education have really been grounded in how do we learn to pay attention when all of the ties that connect us to place have likely been disrupted if perhaps you don't live in the place where you were a kid and you had that wonder as a small child looking at crazy things. If you moved since then, you don't have any thread to that wonder anymore. Or if your community just immigrated here, you may have a lot of stories and wonder about a faraway place, but you don't necessarily have them about the place that you inhabit right now. So how do you sort of re-find those stories and realize that it's even possible to pay attention in that way? And so I'll pause. Uh, I've been working a bunch with students at the Medford High School uh, doing poetry writing workshops and creative uh, essay writing workshops. And there was a line of, from one of the students that really struck me in this way. So their assignment was to go outside and write. They went into the Medford Fells, because that's right behind their high school. And their assignment was to write about a tree with enough specificity that if I took their writing, I could go figure out which tree they were writing about. And they all looked at me, and they were sort of like, oh, OK. And so they all tromped outside, and some of them found their tree, and they're writing away. It was great. And then we reflected back, and some of them were sort of stuck. One of them came up to me and he said, you say, well, how does the tree feel? How do I figure that out? And I said, well, you could touch it. 
He's like, hmm. And, and so that was like, okay, we have more lessons we need to do. Um, but as they were reflecting back, one of the students said to me, I realize that trees are different. And I, she's 10th grader, and so I had a moment of pause and I said, did you think this assignment was possible? And she said, no. And that to me was a wildly humbling moment in, in a way of how much work we have to do as educators and as environmentalists and, and as people to help each other pay attention. Because um, for me, that's just deeply sad. But I know there are lots of things that I can't tell the difference from and that I'm happily walking past many thousands of kinds of mosses saying, moss. Um, and so how, how do we not only learn to pay attention ourselves, but how much of that is from listening and sharing with others and having communication? Because each of us is obsessed with a different minute thing. And I think that's where a lot of wonder comes from, is sharing and listening to those moments of, oh, I think this is a really cool different detail than you do. Now you can share that with me. And so that has been one of the greatest goals for me in this sort of education, is not just here I will tell you lots of information about the Medford Forest, or even can you research a lot of information about the Medford Fell, but more how can we take moments of really paying attention to each other and trying to cultivate some deep paying attention and wonder that we might not have noticed in other ways. And I have to pause here because I have two pictures of, of beautiful local natural spaces. Um, but I don't think that this is just about taking people out into into green spaces or into the woods. They just make for nice pictures on a PowerPoint. But it's also, many of these assignments have been about going into the community, going into Davis Square, and really, what do you hear in Davis Square? What do you listen to? What are the sounds that are meaningful to you in Davis Square? And what are the sounds that you just block out or that you make assumptions about because you never bothered to wonder what constructed those assumptions? And so did you decide that that person was the boss and that person was the employee, what, what was the narrative that told you that that was true? Was it their words or was it something else about what you heard or what you saw? And so sort of asking those questions, not just about trees and natural spaces, but the sort of natural spaces of human interaction and the built, built environments that we've also constructed. And finally, this sort of place-based education seems to me also very much about grounding ourselves in the stories of a place and the communities of a place. So another student um, that I worked with here did a lot of work going to a local church and gathering stories from that church um, of the church members and just thinking about what are the stories we have of our community and of our church building. So how can we really pay attention to that church or that community? And that seems to me not like two separate projects, but like two ideas put in different spaces of, of learning how to pay attention and listen and see those stories as interconnected and as commonly, commonly shared practices. By returning us from the sort of educational space to books, because what I see as, as the biggest challenge is where I started with Silent Spring, and that is listening to, listening to silence, listening to that which is no longer there but should be there or could be there. And that requires a lot of knowledge or a lot of memory or a lot of community that you, you have someone in your community who has been there long enough to know that it wasn't always that way. And that seems like a, a deeply important and, and ever more lost sort of knowledge. There is a, a great story about the Elwha River in, in the Pacific Northwest. People heard of the Elwha? They had a huge dam removal project a few years ago. And as part of the dam removal project, um, the local tribe said, oh, this is great. Our sacred creation site will be uncovered because it has been flooded out by the river. But nobody who was alive had ever seen it because it had been flooded for 100 years. And so the only way they knew it was there was by listening to the stories of their elders and remembering those stories of what it looked like and where it must have been. And so it became this beautiful instance of listening and of memory and of stories and communities because they could find this, this creation site because it had been so well remembered and so well listened to as a community. 
And so when it was revealed, it was still present for them. And that sort of listening across time and within a community, I think, is another big piece of what I'm talking about in this project. And so these two texts, the sort of main highlighted one, undercurrent is about the Pacific Northwest. And it is very much about how do we listen to an entire community? How do we revive the languages of a place? If there are indigenous languages to a place, how might those languages themselves help us pay attention differently? Um, how might doing justice to the people who have lived there thousands of years and found ways of describing it in its particularities help us to pay better attention? And in Zong, the author is looking at a slave ship that threw many, many enslaved people overboard in order to collect insurance money about them. And in the trial documents, they only exist as insurance objects. But she takes apart that trial document and she asks us to think about what were the other sounds present on that ship. And she recreates a very wild sort of poem where words are going in lots of different directions, but saying we can never actually listen to these voices, but we can't listen to this silence as nothing. We have to listen to the silence in the archive or the silence in the ocean as being full of those voices and full of the sounds that are present there. And that, I think, is a very important part of what we need to do moving forward, is not just listening for who's speaking out against the various, various ideas, but whose silences are actually listenable, and they're full of this meaning. So that asks me to, to not get rid of a term, but to question a term. We often talk about communities or people or animals as being silent. I think a lot of time they're not silenced. We aren't listening. But when we name them as silenced, the power is, or the, the onus is on them to speak up. That you've been silenced, we need you to speak up and make sound. If we say silence can be heard, silence can be full of meaning, then it's on us as listeners to figure out ways of paying attention and to figure out ways of listening. And so I think the more that we think of ourselves as listeners, the more we can disrupt some of the power systems that say, like, well, I didn't hear anybody speak out against polluting this river, so I guess it's fine because, you know, nobody voiced an opposition to it. But instead to think about, well, why didn't I hear any opposition to it? What opposition might exist that I wasn't listening to because I'm only used to listening in certain ways or to certain people? So we turn us to Simon Ortiz. I very much recommend reading you have not yet, other than this little bit. You have to listen all the time. If I know anything, it's because of listening. Listening to people, to wind, whatever is murmuring, has been an important part of how I perceive and how I learn. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I just want to take a moment to, to say that thanks to your talk and the last week's talk, I think it's such a change because we are so busy with our own things and you, you guys are making us stop and wait a minute. What is going on around us and why, why is it there? And I don't know, I just want to thank you. My mind is spinning right now. I'm trying <laughs> to make all the connections with what's happening at the, the national level and the local level and, and so on. But I will open the floor for questions. Thank you. Thank you. That was a wonderful talk. Um, I want to ask a question about early on in your presentation. I think you made a comment, although I may have misheard you, saying that you might have to decide um, some people that you might not want to listen to. Um, and I wanted to know what you might how you might decide that. Because um, for me personally, I've been thinking about it a lot recently and thinking like the, the people that I might not want to listen to are people that, that contradict themselves, you know, but a process of learning and growing is always redeveloping your thoughts and you might actually genuinely be contradicting yourself over time. Um, but of course, we might be presented with people who are not doing it in a genuine way. So. Maybe you could just tell us a little bit more of what you were thinking if, if I heard you correctly and 
in suggesting that some people you might not want to listen to? Yeah, that's Thanks. a great question. I have been stewing over that a lot myself. Um, and I, I think I have two answers for you. One of them is that in, in the same, not in the same way, but in a related to way to how we talk about, um, I need to re reform my sentence, sorry. That, that I'm not saying we should listen over speech, but that listening is so undervalued that it's about listening, um, bringing forward listening as something that needs to be balanced in that system, even though it has previously been, if it has previously been undervalued. And so I'm not necessarily saying at any, or in sort of a, in a long-term hopeful way, it would be about listening equally to all of those voices, or at least giving all of them a space to be heard. So it's not about saying, like, you, I never want to hear your voice again. Um, I think that's a sort of an extreme version of this that ends up not being the same sort of message. But because some voices have been so overamplified, it's about saying, okay, well, we've heard from you a lot. What are some voices that we're not listening to very well? How can we sort of amplify those for a while? Um, how that plays out in daily life is a challenge that I continue to confront. Um, I think that I have been challenging myself to listen to voices that make me uncomfortable as much as I am able in order to, to sort of practice where are the places that connections can be made or bridges can be found that we won't hear from yelling at each other or from creating walls, um, how much that metaphor has become strengthened, but, but that we, in listening to those sort of people that we don't want to listen to so much, but without saying, you have power, so therefore I think you're worth listening to. I think that was more what that story is trying to get at, of saying, just because we have this father figure, this sort of embodiment of the patriarchy in various ways, doesn't mean that what they're saying is the advice we should follow. And so questioning the power structures of who gets listened to most and who doesn't. Not so much about never listening to those people. That's a great question. Um, my question is about more the first part of the presentation, where you spoke about listening to non-human others, animals, plants, etc. And I was wondering if you could speak a little more about some of those connections between humans and non-humans. You kind of talked about how um, we don't listen to plants and animals, and that might hurt them, and then they'll die. The um, you know the the goat doesn't speak anymore, um, and that maybe hurting some of those plants and animals hurts us. But do you think that listening to some of those connections can help us understand human stories more in certain ways? Yeah. So that's a great question. So I think there there are two pieces to that. There are lots of people in various ways who are paying attention to what we can learn from plants, non, other than human animals and plants, and sort of saying, maybe trees are doing this better than we are. Maybe we should pay more attention to how trees are communicating, and we can learn from that. Um, and I think that it's important to think of it as learning from them, as opposed to saying, uh, you know, they're, they're serving a symbolic purpose that we can sort of um, put ourselves as humans onto them and anthropomorphize them into human-like creatures that do human-like things. That seems like not the goal, um, because then we're just turning everyone into subhumans, which is really what we've been doing for a long time. Um, but I think there's also a layer to which um, emphasizing the importance of not figuring out how they teach us about being human is also important um, in the same way that you might listen to someone not for how they can benefit you or how they matter to you, but you could listen to them as being important just for themselves. Um, and I think that that is maybe one of our challenges in doing this, is both that we can learn from and, and have a lot to connect with and realize that the similarities between ourselves and all of these other living beings, but also to remember we don't have to turn them into humans. Part of what makes a goat a goat is that it's not human, and that's awesome. Um, so it goes both ways. That was really beautiful. Thank you so much. I don't know if it's a question or a comment, but I was listening to NPR this morning, and there was a really interesting story about how quickly you come to agreement when you're sharing food, mm. and you have to be sharing the same food. So they get an experiment where they gave um, people either both sweets, both salty snacks, or they gave one person sweet and the other person salty. Mm. 
And it turns out that it took twice as long to come to agreement when the two con- connectors, the two listeners, were eating different foods. Mm. And I'm just curious, given that study, what are your reflections as you think about listening? That's a, a fascinating study. So the first thing that pops in my mind is sort of a non sequitur, but I'll see if I can rope it around. So I've just finished reading um, the, hidden, uh, the Hidden Lies of Trees, which has been on New York Times bestseller. It's about tree communication and forestry. And he talks a lot about how slow trees are. And so maybe one of the things that, that comes from that or that, and that connects back to Gabe's point is, is maybe we're trying to go too fast. And so it isn't a problem that it takes longer for those, those two people to figure out who gets how much of a bite of Snickers and how much a bite of pretzel. Um, but that our system is so driven on speed that we're not giving ourselves enough time for listening. Um, and that's, I guess, maybe part of this thing, what would it look like to value listening more? It would be about giving more time to those sorts of uh, discussion dialogue spaces because they are going to take more time. That's part of why we avoid them. Um, but that's our, our choice. We have constructed the system to not give them time. Um, we could construct systems that have listening tours or that have a full day where you listen to all the elders talking about what they've been noticing about their community. That just, that's a, a time we are not choosing to take. My reaction was different because I was thinking that it's about the shared, by sharing whatever the experience is, whether it's a food or whether it's a forest landscape or the green square, by just having something shared in common. Makes you better. Mm. That's where that's where I was thinking is that we'll take the time, we're more likely to take the time to listen for sharing the same experience. I think that that's also potentially true. That if that if we have a shared experience, we want to take the time to to figure it out. And I think that is a lot of what the sort of environmental educators that are really invested in place are counting on in some ways. That if we really share a love for our small town, we will take the time to figure out how to share it and treat it well and equitably. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Thank you for that talk. That was really beautiful and thought provoking. Um, I guess I, one of the parts that I liked most was how much time you spent looking at various pieces of art uh, in addition to the book. It seems like that's maybe one of your ways of cultivating this habit of listening, Um, albeit Seeing, obviously, but paying attention. So I was just wondering what suggestions you have for people or students that are later in their life, right? We're no longer in high school, and how we can sort of cultivate that habit of learning, of listening, excuse me. Mm-hmm. Is that like listening outside of our discipline or mm-hmm. what other? That's a lovely about? question. Um, so I have definitely been learning this myself. I grew up as someone who liked paying attention but wasn't obsessed with it in the way I am now. Um, <laughs> but, but a few of the things that strike me when you ask that question, one of them is sort of going to places that feel a little less familiar because your brain goes, oh, this is new, and it pays much more attention, and to try to notice what you're doing differently when you have something new before you and then to bring those habits of observation back to something that isn't as new and say, oh, can I pay attention to this with as much sort of surprise and enthusiasm and even discomfort as I had in that new place. You'll notice, like I notice that when I'm walking a familiar street, if I'm not thinking about it, I don't see anything as I'm walking that familiar street. But if I'm walking in a new neighborhood, and I don't know where I'm going, I'm paying so much attention. And so just try to, can you pull that back? Um, and another piece for me has been reading across disciplines, like reading this um, Robin Wall Kimmerer's Ethnobotany. I'm not a biologist, I'm not a botanist, but hearing somebody else's enthusiasm really helps me say, oh, I haven't really been paying that much attention to that in my own work. How could I pull that in? But sort of to have that framework of what are you enthusiastic about? Can I join you in your enthusiasm for a moment and see what that's like? And then bring that back in various ways. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, This brought back a very uh, fond memory of some 20 years when I had the opportunity to be in a conservation project on a 9,000-foot summit uh, near the Salt Lake Desert. And the first two days that I was there, I kept hearing flies, but I couldn't see them. Mm. 
And finally, I blurted out among a bunch of people that were in the project, where are these flies? And they all started laughing. And they said, it's white noise emptying out of your head. What I'm learning from you today is that listening is subjective. And hearing is objective to the extent that we're surrounded by a constant cacophony of noise. And we don't hear all that there is to hear, much less be attuned to listening to squirrels, whatever, butterflies, whatever else is in, in the environment. But when I came back from that project after 10 days, and during those 10 days, the only things that you could hear were planes flying over mm. at 40, 50,000 feet, and then the jet aircraft that were flying below the mountain level because there was a military base, training base nearby but you could only hear the sounds of what other people were doing. So you could be hundreds of yards away from somebody and they could zip up their pants and you would hear that clearly. So I came back, I was living down uh, off of uh, Powderhouse Square and I walked up to the campus that morning and I had a ripping migraine headache by the time I got here. Mm -hmm. And then I was in the chapel for an event I went, uh, that, that afternoon and I could hear people walking around campus, and I'm almost certain that I was hearing a couple of students walking down by the campus center having a conversation because my hearing was so attuned to open space, but my head was pounding because of how much was coming back in mm. to my That's hearing. And the opportunity to listen is compromised by the den of modernity, I suppose. Yeah. Just an observation. Oh, that's fascinating. I do find that a lot when I go to a place that is like, you know, in the woods of Vermont, that is genuinely very quiet and just sit there and try to be as quiet myself, that I notice more and more sounds. And then when I come back here, I'm like, oh, there's so many sounds. Um, so I think that is that there are habits of paying attention. So maybe one of the other things in terms of practicing this is a matter of sitting and saying, what are all of the things I can hear? And to try to pay attention to that and notice what are all those things that I'm blocking out to stay sane, to not give myself a migraine, but to take moments where you, you challenge those constructed bounds that you've made for yourself. Um, and I think that can be really valuable. I also have to recommend growing things as a way of learning to pay attention. I am an avid gardener, and there is no time I pay more attention um, than when my sprout is just about to come up and I see so many things. And so sort of having that moment of, of watching life changing where you feel like it's part of you, that's a, that's a great way of learning to pay attention. Um, thank you, this definitely gave me a lot to think about. Um, and I guess something I've been struggling with a lot recently is just how protesting and campaigns fit into all of this mm -hmm. and so like how can us as like-minded people who see environmental injustices and see climate change happening, does like our efforts and our energy, um, does, are we making noise over the silence and making it harder to be heard? Hmm. That's, kind of what I'm thinking. That's a really good question. And I think sometimes yes, and sometimes no. And that's something to be paying attention to. I often think of protests as being largely about us hearing each other and being surrounded by a community of people who care about a common issue and to have that common strength that you gather from being surrounded by thousands of people who care about something with you. And so it's not so much about being heard, it's somewhat about being heard by other people, but I have some questions of how much that happens sometimes. Sometimes it really does, but sometimes it's much more about hearing each other in those spaces and regaining energy. Um, but I think you're right that there's also a, a way in which people who have a fair amount of power already can make a lot of noise and then make it hard to hear those who don't have power. And so I think those of us who have quite a bit of power, one of our main, I think of one of my main goals is, is thinking of myself as a listener and trying to figure out who in this community has something to say that I'm not listening to and how could I create a space for that in some way. And so not even about speaking out about it, but just about creating more listening spaces. Thank you so much. Thank you.